Andra's three decades of experience in international business and engaging with Asian tiger economies is the foundation upon which he adds value to all businesses wanting to engage with the Asian century. Currently helping businesses and professional bodies understand the intricacies of the geopolitics of trade in a region dominated by China. These insights are shared in his books, China's Belt Road Initiative, The Challenge for the Middle Kingdom Through a New Logistics Paradigm, and as a contributing author, Digital Transformation of Logistics, Chapter 13, Exploring the Digital Silk Road. Please welcome Andre as he shares his insights on digital supply chain with us today. Hello and welcome to our journey along the digital supply chain. My name is Andre Wheeler, keynote speaker and author in this area, particularly with regard to the digitalization of logistics and supply chain within Asia and China. In, ep in episode one today, we take a look at some of the key concepts and key understandings that are needed in order to fully appreciate what is happening within our supply chains as the world becomes more global and more digital and more open. Sit back, relax and enjoy. The principles and some of the characteristics of digital supply chain is Associate Professor Flavio Macau. Flavio is a lecturer and researcher of global logistics and supply chain management at Edith Cowan University in Perth. He is also a national board member for the Association of Supply Chain Institute. Welcome, Flavio, and I look forward to your insights with regarding the digital supply chain. First up, we have seen a, through e-commerce, we have seen a, a, an, an explosion of interest in last mile and first mile delivery. Can you please explain what is meant by first mile and last mile delivery considerations within the digital supply chain? Sure, sure, Andres, and thank you for having me here today. So the, the idea of digital supply chain is really important nowadays because, as you said, we are living in a world where we have you know, with global logistics, products being manufactured in many different parts, and then we have to end up integrating those parts, uh, and we'll have to move containers with pieces coming from you know, all, all corners of the globe. And to integrate all this complexity, it is really important that we have a digital system in place. So if you go back, I don't know, to the 1900s and you think about the Ford Motor Company and how they did things, it was really verticalized and they could control every step in their manufacturing and they would actually own uh, most of the steps in their manufacturing. And what you have today is kind of the opposite. So you have many different companies, independent companies, that come together in this thing called a global supply chain. And to bring all those companies together to manufacture the, the, the right parts at the right time and deliver them to the right places is something really, really complex. And to deal with that complexity, we, we must have digitalization, we must have information systems that expedite the communication and, and allow uh, these supply chains to properly work. If you think about, uh, as an example, when you are moving a container from one country to the other and you think about the customs, uh, it's not like you know the government is going and opening every single container to look what it is inside. It is about uh, inputting the information in the system and then the system checking that, that that information is reliable, that it is accurate, and then it all goes and it all moves as it should. And when we think about last mile logistics and first mile logistics in this context of digitalization. Uh, what we will have, let, let's talk about why it is important to have digitalization in the first mile. Uh, you know, consumers nowadays are more and more interested in things like traceability, the ability to track a, a product uh, through all the tiers in supply chain, the supply chain, tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, and know where all the parts came from 
and how we obtain and manufacture those parts. Uh, as an example, if there was, I don't know, modern slavery involved in that, or what is, was the impact in the environment uh, to obtain that product. So uh, it's really important for companies who are in the start of the supply chain to provide that information so that those customers can be satisfied. So that's one aspect of uh, thinking about the first mile. Another aspect is again, to uh, allow companies to understand what is going on in the supply chain. So I, I am in the beginning of that global logistics and I am supplying this given product. Uh, it is important that my system gathers accurate data about that product and that I pass that accurate data to the next step in the supply chain. So my client, the other company, can guarantee that uh, what they need is satisfied by my company and then the product moves and then the information moves uh, along with it. So it is important to have that kind of information data communication from the very beginning, from the first mile of the supply chain. When we think about the last mile, we think about the final consumer, about the final client. And again, I'll compare with the past. In the past, people would go to a shopping center or to a Walmart store in the US and they would you know, have those big cars and buy dozens of products at a time. So at the end of the day, they would have the, the, their trunks full of products of stuff. And it was organized in this way with you know, big stores. Everything is there for you to touch, to pick, to put in your physical cart and bring it home. Uh, so yeah, you would do that maybe one time per week, maybe one time per month. Uh, what we have today is that you have your mobile and suddenly you think, well, you know, I, I, I need a new chair for my office. Then you go to Amazon or you go to eBay or, or the likes, and then you click a couple of buttons. And if you want to, in four minutes time, you just bought a new chair. Then a couple of hours later, you are looking around. Oh, I am out of ink for my printer. I need to buy more ink. You don't go to the store. You don't go to the mall. Again, you get your phone and you click, 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 click. And then you expect that in a couple of days, sometimes in a couple of hours, someone will come to your home and deliver that office chair, deliver that ink for your printer. So what you have is now a lot more granularity in how consumers behave nowadays. And to cope with that granularity, with this big volume of deliveries of diversified products that don't have happen like once per week, but many times a day, you need a lot of information sharing and processing and analyzing that to make this more efficient. And that's why we need digitalization in this last mile as well, in this delivery from the warehouse to the final customer, most of the times with e-commerce in their very homes. Very fascinating, uh, Flavia. Now, during the discussion or during your, 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 your brief description, there appears to be a need for integrated data, a level of integration and data exchange along the program. What do we understand? What do, you, what do we need to understand about successful data integration along the supply chain? That, that's a very important question. So what is successful data integration? Is the ability of seamlessly making that information go through travel the supply chain. So by that integration, you, we must understand that in this complexity of many different companies from many different countries, many companies will uh, use different systems, different IT systems that operate in a way. Some companies will have to cope with two, three, maybe four different systems because they have they are integrated in such different supply chains and they have to communicate with all of them. So uh, it's really important for to have a, 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 a companies organizing the flow of information in supply chain and then bringing these systems together so they can talk to each other because when system from company A 
does not talk properly with the system on company B, what you have is a mismatch uh, of that information. Uh, the, the, the data says, tells you one thing, and then real life, when you open the container, tells you a different story. And then you have lots of you know, inefficiencies uh, in your supply chain. When you get company A and company B and those systems uh, talk in the same language, so they can exchange information in real time in an accurate way, you have the ability to really organize and make your supply chain more efficient so that when you open the box, when you open the container, what you get is precisely what you wanted at the quantity that you wanted as you expected. And this way you can replan and optimize your supply chain and make it definitely more efficient and more cost effective. During talks with a number of supply chain managers, there's, there's often a, a, a feeling that there's a difference between an open system and a closed system. Um, what would we need to be aware of and what would be the dangers or principal shortcomings of each particular system? That, that's a really important question. So let's talk first about open systems. And the nature of open systems is that, you know, in a way, anyone can get into the open system at any time and gather whatever piece of information that they need because it is open. So one thing that you must guarantee, and it's hard to do in an open system, is about you know, the cybersecurity of that open system. Uh, what kind of protocols you have, what kind uh, of apps and softwares and responsibilities that you have in the system because it will be open for everyone to see. And another thing is how comfortable some companies are to provide information to an open system where other companies, even their competitors would be able in principle to obtain that information. And that information may as well be strategic, uh, maybe very important, maybe even uh, you know, add value to the operation of your company in, in a way that you, you don't want that to, to reach your competitor. So you think, well, should I go, go into an open system? Uh, should that information be available to everyone? Sometimes you can organize an open system. You manage to put together a very safe blockchain-like system, and then you have that organized by uh, not-for-profit or by cooperatives or by the government, which is great when it works, but I would say that's not the dominant model in the market nowadays. The dominant market is you have usually someone that has a, a bit more of control over the supply chain. And this, let's say big company, this big player, they set the rules, they set the protocols, they set the responsibilities, what information will be put in the system, by whom, who will have access to that. And in organizing the, the information flow, and organizing roles and responsibilities. At the end of the day, it becomes uh, you know, more strategic because the information will not go into uh, the hands of competitors. And you can, in principle, at least enforce cybersecurity with a little bit more, you know, uh, in a little bit more safe way in that you are not worried about every single person going into an open system. You are only worried about those very specific points in your closed system where people will have access to information and you can, if you have a, a proper cybersecurity policy, you con can control that in a much more efficient way. Many thanks for sharing your insights, Flavia. I've really found it fascinating and stripping away some of the, the mystery around digital supply chains and what it means and what it needs. Once again, thank you for joining me and I wish you all the best as you chase your students towards final year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. See you. Bye bye. bye.
Okay, welcome to this discussion on digital supply chains. Over the next 10 episodes or so, we will explore the emerging trend in supply chain and logistics, namely the move towards visibility and transparency of product across the supply chain, how data is collected, shared, and what this means for business. This has been particularly shaped by the advent of e-commerce and accelerated through COVID. We will discuss the fundamentals and challenges of digital supply chains with regards smart ports, cities, and achieving end-to-end -end seamless and integrated supply chains with specialists and supply chain experts. In episode one, we take a look at some of the key concepts that are central to understand what is meant by a digital supply chain. And joining me today is Jean Legier, who will talk about his role and his experience with digital supply chains. Jean is a French Australian. He's based in Asia. He has a company in Singapore and really works in the technology space and applying was lean methods in manufacturing and bringing a digital interface to it. Jean, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andre. <clears throat> Thank you for your introduction and having me here. Let me jump in right on right on the topic. I mean, this is uh, this discussion we're having today is quite uh, a hot and uh, complex topic, which uh, interestingly was on the 2021 World Economic Forum agenda in Davos, Switzerland. So um, I was quite surprised seeing that, and I made a little bit of research, and I thought, "Wow, Andre is coming up with a, with a very hot and interesting topic." So j just elaborating a little bit on that. So in, in a nutshell, um, across B2B and B2C industries, you have uh, customers, investors, employees, and regulators who are all demanding sustainable products and business models. And uh, uh, that was mentioned during that forum is uh, uh, there are three ways a digital supply chain can fulfill this uh, sustainability promise. So the first one is uh, uh, the up, what I call the upstream visibility, right? Um, digi digital tracing technologies allow uh, manufacturers and brands to shine a light on supply networks. Then there's the upstream suppliers play uh, a critical role here since uh, they know the provenance and, uh, of inputs and materials. So uh, it means encourage suppliers to improve their own products tracing and uh, it could be a potential challenge sometime for some manufacturers if uh, they are not one of their suppliers' major customers. New technology, of course, can provide the incentive mechanism, for example, blockchain can house the, the provenance data for specific inputs uh, and do so with the required privacy. It allows customers to choose the products that fits their buying criteria and sustainability standards, which in turn will lead to more demand and revenue for those suppliers who can meet those standards. That, that's so that was the, the, the first topic, yeah? Yeah. So that's a very interesting um, discussion around the, the, the upstream. But if you have upstream visibility, you would also need to have downstream, visi downstream visibility as well. What is meant by that, downstream visibility of product or manufacturing? Yeah, that's right, Andre. Uh, so, so basically uh, on the downstream side, uh, we're talking uh, about digital tracing products after the point of sales. Uh, it allows to follow those products throughout uh, their life cycle. And uh, we call that a digital threat. It opens up opportunities for new services, business models, and uh, uh, allows manufacturers to proactively manage the products end of life through the, through the remanufacturing or recycling. So it's quite, quite advanced. Uh, this is simpler in B2B relationships where, where services contracts govern customer relationships and information sharing. On the consumer side, um, maintaining a digital thread while still protecting the privacy of uh, uh, end customer is more tricky. Uh, in Australia, we have this Privacy Act. In Thailand, we have the, the PPDA Act. In, in Europe, you have the GDPR. I mean, all these, uh, uh, all these things are quite complex and uh, um, effective industry coalitions and partnership with consumer organization are the our must. And, and can uh, hopefully bring a uh, practical solution within all this uh, uh, privacy complexity. So what you're saying, Jean, is that digital te technology and partnerships are absolutely essential 
in establishing a digital supply chain. That, that, that's right, absolutely. I mean, this is it's very important to maintain this uh, uh, the relationship with humans, the human side. It's not only about tech, right? And and this is where this partnership with organization association is, is very important. It allows to eliminate some complexity. Mm. Um, and within me, digital, uh, go ahead, yeah. Sorry, Jean. And within the digital supply chain, or particularly setting up digital parameters, there's often referral to product author, authentication to promote the reuse of the data. Uh, can you please explain what that means in your perspective, particularly around last mile, first mile delivery? Right. Okay. Um, product authentication is uh, is basically a way to promote uh, reuse. Um, mm -hmm. Digital tracing technology can uh, can help authenticate products and goods for resale. Um, this is already quite relevant in uh, industrial application, but uh, is also quite valuable in in the growing secondary market for many consumer goods. Um, digital verific verification technologies can increase consumer trust and uh, extend the life of products. Um, it can also align the interest of brands and uh, secondary marketplace that uh, historically had uh, uh, limited reasons to collaborate and share data. Brands across the industry look to extend the life of their products and uh, actively manage the consumer experience in secondary markets. And certification that a product bears an authentic brand can help uh, reduce the uh, volume and value of counterfeit. Now, coming back to your to your original question uh, in relation to the uh, the first mile and the last mile. Um, well, that, this is all about validating that data are correct, right? And and, and you need a, a proper digital tracing to ensure that those data are, are going to be right. So it's within the same parameter, right? It's, uh, uh, it's touching a specific point on supply chain in relation to shipping, but it's touching the same topic. How has digital supply chain added value or you added value to, to digital supply chain through the lean methodology? Sure, good, good, good question. I mean, the, the lean part is, is basically all about uh, improving processes uh, and uh, uh, absorbing from, uh, from your team uh, the best practice. And often you have people in, a, in operation, I mean, it can be on a shipping boat, can be in a, in a big factory, where good ideas are coming from, from what I call the front runners, the guys who are touching operation. And uh, uh, the challenge with that is those guys have great ideas, but those ideas are not documented and they are not traceable. They are not replicable. And uh, this is where the digital uh, advantage comes in. Digitality allows you to capture those data, secure them, share them with an entire platform, and, uh, and then you can basically leverage the value of these best practices. So that, that's where the power of, uh, of Lean together with digital is coming from. Excellent. Very interesting. My last question to you, Jean, is what is, in your view, the main challenge to implement a successful digital supply chain? Um, very good question, Andre. Actually, it's a question that is coming back often. I mean, people are wondering, I mean, uh, why the hell are you coming with all this tech when, when our people can hardly understand uh, some basic, uh, basic technology? And uh, that's why I'm coming back to uh, what I call people first. Uh, you have to put people first, meaning that uh, uh, you have to consider all, all the whole range of challenge, including technology adoption. Technology adoption is critical. Right? You have to, to convince your team uh, and uh, put in place the right culture to ensure that your team are going to get on board with that. It has to be something for them. And, and if you can sell it that way, well, you're going to make it, right? So you're going to start by the best practice with Lean. And then you're going to move forward to technology and uh, data retention, data sharing, and, and all this will be very beneficial to your operation and your business. Many thanks. Thank you, Jean, for joining me today. And I look forward to future discussions on this very interesting and wide topic. Thank you. Very welcome, Andre. Thank you. Yeah, we'll keep in touch.
definitions and concepts within digital supply chains is Chris Kosmala. Chris is an international consultant on supply chain and supply chain optimization and is well versed in understanding the key concepts and key criteria in setting up a digital supply chain. So Chris, welcome to the show. And perhaps a good starting point would be to discuss what is meant by optimal visibility of cargo? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Andre. You're starting with a big question, of course, right? Um, uh, one of the issue of, of optimal invisibility is that uh, when you think about this, uh, different shippers have different expectations of, of what optimal actually is, right? When you think about the range of optimal, it could essentially stretch from, I want to know that my shipment is on the promised transport, right? That I, I booked, reserved, and it was given to me. Uh, maybe then progressing to where it is specifically, geographically, in its journey, all the way to what is the state of the shipment inside the packaging of, of that shipment, right? That's, that's also visibility. So, so what, what is optimal will vary from, from shipper to shipper. Um, there is also this idea of, um, do I want to know once in a while or do I want to know in real time, right? Um, so, so visibility will really depend on what, what kind of um, monitoring system you have set up in place. And, uh, what is the transporter allowing you to see from, uh, from the transport? Um, and then, of course, you have uh, to process how you change or how you exchange this visibility into uh, a, a decision supporting insight, right? Because ultimately, just knowing where the stuff is, that is still not enough if you don't know the impact of, of that position and the state of the cargo on how this will influence your supply chain. Um, so you are looking uh, really at sensors, right? You know, are we talking about reporting by sensors? Are we talking about um, IOTs, talking back to base, which is your base, your control tower, uh, and then you making the decision at the control tower and issuing some sort of orders to the IOTs to do this or that inside the cargo, if that's possible, right? You know, typical things would be generator failure, let's say on the, on the reefer container. You could issue an IOT alert saying, you know, change temperature on a, uh, inside the box by running generator differently, all the way to edge, edge IT, AI, AI. So we, you're running intelligence on the sensor, no talking back to base, the sensor decides what, what to act. So you see many variants of the optimal and many variants of the visibility. Uh, that all is a, is a big issue for uh, the shippers to decide what it is that they want and then invest properly or deal with transporters who will give them capability that they need to ensure that visibility as perceived by that ship. Uh, thank, thank, thanks for that, Chris. Now, you mentioned real-time visibility. Are there benefits associated with real-time visibility? And, and what does it actually mean? Well, for, for some types of cargo, uh, real-time is not worth the expense, right? Because remember, um, while being on the road, you can access terrestrial network and it's reasonably cheap to send the data, even, even large sets of data over, over the terrestrial network. At uh, the moment you start dealing with sea freight, um, uh, accessing status of the cargo or, to, uh, or having your cargo talking back to you in real time over a satellite link, that becomes very quickly, very expensive, right? And sometimes it's not, not even possible, right? Because you may not even have that capability granted to you by the transporter itself. Um, uh, but for some cargo, uh, uh, where the temperature sensitivity could vary, let's say, you know, between uh, point 0.1, uh, degrees Celsius and, you know, 0.5 degrees Celsius, uh, and uh, with the variant being um, the cargo is good, the cargo could be destroyed, yeah, simply uh, lose the freshness, let's say, uh, then you would like to know in real time, because if you know in real time, you may be able to rearrange this cargo to essentially be dropped off, let's say, uh, at different destination to still catch some um, uh, fresh uh, use by uh, uh, parameters of the cargo, um, and then maybe arrange alternative transport for you farther of locations from the from the original destination um, to to ensure that you know we have a let's say longer shelf shelf time, uh, longer uh, longer period during which the cargo can be actually sitting over there and be resold, let's say, right to somebody else. So there are certain expectations of 
what is the cargo and and you will you will, you will see some cargos actually a real time uh, will make a huge difference. But in some cargo, uh, real time doesn't really buy you anything other than you know just spending a lot of money to seeing this in real time. But it does not really help. Also, the second thing is how do you use that information to plan? If you're not planning in real time, planning and scheduling in real time of your supply chain, then knowing the status of the cargo, visibility of the cargo in real time makes no difference because you have information in real time, but you're processing in batch for the purpose of your insight and decision-making. Uh, so you have to make sure that you synchronize the frequency, both you planning and scheduling of your supply chain with the optimization tool. Uh, if they are not, not real time, then real time visibility makes no sense. Or vice versa, if you have a batch visibility, but you know, from time to time, but you, you're planning in real time and scheduling in real time, then obviously you have a mismatch, right? So you have to make sure that this is aligned. That's again, that's a responsibility of the shipper or the beneficial cargo owner. This is not the responsibility of the transporter, right? That's very interesting insights. So in other words, the, the whole idea of having visibility, real-time visibility is really situational specific, depending on your cargo and what the parameters are for that cargo. Well, not only this, but also the parameters of your supply chain. How do you manage your supply chain, right? Because while um, a lot of platforms and a, lo a lot of um, you know, startups talk about um, wanting to do supply chain optimization, uh, transporters, or, you know, when, they, when they spend more money on, uh, on, on their platforms, they talk about supply chain optimization. But really, th this is not supply chain optimization. This is logistics part of the supply chain management optimization, right? Um, uh, supply chain management is internal to the company, which is actually running their supply chain. And I, and I think that that's a, that's a big thing to understand, right? You may not know actually what the supply chain, complete supply chain network of the shipper looks like. So therefore as a transporter, you just have to essentially commit to fulfilling the expectations that the shipper had with you, either in form of a, you know, contract for, for carriage, right? Okay. That's a, that's a, that's a big thing. It's, it's all internal to the ship. Okay. Now, now, Chris, often during the discussion around digital supply chain, two words are used. People often refer to visibility and transparency. Are they the same or are they different concepts altogether? No, no, they're, they're very different, right? So when you, when you think about visibility, that is, that is your way to essentially knowing something about the cargo, right? How it moves through the network. Uh, geographically and in time, right? And, and also with the status, which we, which we talk about this, that's a sensor. But transparency itself, you know, that, that is the word that's like, that's as broad word as sustainability, right? You really, really don't know what that is. So let's say transparency of, is it transparency of the rate? Is it transparency of the transport availability? Is it transparency of uh, the process that is required to move the cargo between uh, a place of origin and place of destination. Let's say, you know, what kind of customs obligations there are, what kind of uh, uh, material safety obligations there are and so on and so on. So, so really transparency has a lot. And one of the biggest enemies of transparency is of course uh, fragmentation, right? This is fragmentation of sources of data and fragmentation of the decision that was taken by somebody on your behalf okay, reading the same data, right? So for instance, uh, a, if you, one of the you know, typical examples, let's, let's talk about uh, sea freight. Um, when you make arrangements for a bill of lading, you know, one of the information that you have to put in is uh, the ship's IMO number, right? Onto the bill of lading, if it travels overseas. Um, the, sh the transporter will give you that IMO number, right? This is the ship that this will, end up on. However, there is no obligation of the transporter to actually put that your shipment on that particular IMO uh, uh, number chip, right? Because that ship may be late and the shipper or the transporter may take immediate real-time decision to reroute your cargo on a different ship, okay? This information may not make it back to you and there will be no changes of, on, the, uh, on the bill of lading uh, done by you. It may be done by the carrier who sometimes forgets about this, sometimes it's not done, right? So when you're talking about the paper, once you type the information on the paper, it's very difficult to, to erase it, right? So uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination of things. 
where the information um, is fragmented and sometimes it's not even correctly linked to the process that you're executing, right? Which is moving cargo from point A to point B. So if we can defragment these sources of information and if we can defragment also the types of the documentation that, that travels with the cargo, uh, this could be a great step towards transparency. But then of course, you know, we have to talk about the quality of the data, right? So how do we ensure that every participant um, in submitting and reading the data actually reads the same data label and understands the same thing from that data label? And of course, the capability of the interfaces, right? We're talking APIs, APIs. Everybody has um, uh, uh, API, right? So application programmatic interface. But some of those interfaces are wider, if you will, than others, right? So you can have an API to the rating engine, but that API may only transfer certain information about the rating. But another API to another engine may open more information about your rates, right? Um, and, uh, and about potential routings, let's say. So there's a lot of things inside the API that are, again, not standardized. So whenever somebody says, well, I have an API or we have an API for, for transparency, well, uh, that does not line up if you use a few of these and, uh, and you may have higher quality data from one API or transfer through one API versus through another. So transparency is the issue of visibility of the data, of the quality of the data, the labeling of the data in such a way that everybody understands the same thing through the same data label, and of course the capability of the APIs to move that data around. So big things, right? The big difference between visibility yeah. and transparency. Thanks very much, Chris. That, that, that's a, a really important clarification because I think often people get confused between the difference of visibility and transparency. Chris, thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, I've really enjoyed the discussion and, and I wish you all the best going forward in your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thanks for the invitation. I hope that this episode has given you greater clarity and understanding around some of the key issues and concepts within digital supply chain, and particularly in digital supply chain management as the globe and global trade moves towards a digitalized platform. I'd like to thank my guests on the show for sharing their insights into this very interesting and crucial area. More importantly, I'd like to say thank you to you for watching and hope you will join me next time as we continue with a look and journey along the digital supply chain.